Okay, so uh, welcome to the uh, China Town Hall uh, today at uh, April 9th um, and 2024. Uh, we're also going to be uh, joined later on uh, by the uh, Assistant uh, U.S. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, Kurt Campbell, uh, and uh, we're first joined uh, by our, our first speaker, uh, Chichun Zhu. Uh, he is a professor of uh, political science and international relations at Bucknell University, uh, and uh, he was uh, Bucknell's international relations uh, department chair uh, and uh, the inaugural director of the China Institute, uh, MacArthur Chair Professor in uh, East Asian Politics. Uh, in the early 1990s, he was the senior assistant to the Consul for Press and Cultural Affairs at the uh, U.S. Consulate uh, General in Shanghai. Uh, Professor Zhu's teaching and research interests uh, include uh, Chinese politics and uh, foreign policy, uh, East Asian political economy, uh, U.S. Asian relations and uh, international relations theories, uh, he's the author and editor of over uh, a dozen books, including Security, Development, and Sustainability in Asia, and uh, you know a long list of publications. Uh, Professor Zhu has received many research fellowships and grants, including the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Award to Australia, an uh, NEH Fellowship for U.S.-China Relations Seminar, two POSCO Fellowships at the East-West Center in Hawaii, and many research grants, uh, appointments also in Japan, Korea, China, uh, and also from the American Political Science Association, he re received a research grant. Uh, he's a noted scholar on Chinese foreign policy, and Dr. Chu is also a member of the National Committee on United States-China Relations, and is frequently quoted by international media on Chinese and East Asian affairs. Uh, and also, he maintains a, a popular column for Think China and Singapore, so without uh, further uh, ado, um, uh, Mr. Chu, so please come up here. Uh, so yeah, just yeah, just uh, stand in front of the computer. And, okay, and, so uh, people can see me, right? Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so... Uh, well, so we say uh, uh, welcome to uh, Dr. Alice Jackson, uh, also the chair in the uh, political science department uh, here at uh, Morgan State uh, University. And okay, yeah. okay, I feel like it's weird. I feel like I sit there and talk to you. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I I think because for the Zoom audience, you have to. Oh, uh, okay, here. okay. So Zoom audience, okay, all right, okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu, Dr. Harrison, <laughs> and for having me here. It's really a great pleasure. You know, um, so the national program will start at uh, six thirty, right? So we have about uh, twenty minutes or so. So what I'm going to do is, as uh, Larry suggested, I uh, will just lay down some uh, uh, foundation for our discussion later. So I'm going to offer some uh, observations about the, the latest developments uh, in U.S.-China relations. Uh, I mean, we all know that uh, uh, this relationship is is uh, complicated, right? Uh, but it's also uh, evolving and changing all the time. So many issues uh, will be emerging or re-emerging uh, uh, to uh, challenge this relationship, right? So, so today, what I'm, uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, uh, offer some uh, explanations of what's going on you know, in a relationship uh, in certain areas, right? Uh, again, uh, we cannot cover everything. So first I'm going to cover is, uh, is the, the uh, uh, latest call, phone call between uh, President Biden and the President uh, Xi Jinping, right? Actually, they just called each other uh, a week ago, April 2nd, right? Um, what is interesting for me is that both sides, You, if you look at the readouts from both sides, right? Both sides said the two leaders had a uh, candid and constructive dialogue, right? I mean, you know, candid and constructive. These are diplomatic jargon, right? <laughs> candid means, uh, you know, they apparently failed <laughs> to achieve any consensus or agreement on a lot of issues, right? Uh, that's the candid part. Constructive part, I think that's important. Uh, I mean, uh, basically means that, you know, they, uh, they, agree that there are many differences, right? They cannot agree with each other, 
but they want to keep this relationship uh, stable, right? They want to move forward. Uh, that's why you know uh, they 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 have kept the communications channel open. Uh, they have uh, they have met with each other actually uh, 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 several times. Uh, most recently, uh, last November in uh, in San Francisco, right? And uh, and uh, as part of the effort to uh, keep talking to each other, keep engaged, actually. Uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, Jenny Yellen just came back from China yesterday, I believe, right? And in a few weeks, uh, Secretary of State uh, 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 Antony Blinken will travel to China. So uh, you, you see the two sides are actually talking to each other uh, despite the differences, right? Uh, but that's very important, I think, right? Yeah. So that's the first development. Uh, second development, I want to turn to uh, uh, Taiwan. You know? uh, it's a very important issue. Uh, many people say that it, it's probably an explosive issue between the United States and China, right? Uh, we all know that uh, early this year in January, uh, Taiwan had a, a, a presidential election and uh, the candidate from the Democratic Progressive Party, DPP, uh, won the election. Uh, and of course the current uh, president is also from the DPP. Uh, so uh, you can tell the DPP uh, is, is is taking a strong hold in, in Taiwanese politics. But the problem is uh, uh, the Chinese side, the PRC, doesn't like the DPP, right? <laughs> because the DPP is, is you know, pro-independence. Uh, they don't uh, uh, recognize uh, one China, right? Uh, they don't recognize this concept called 1992 consensus, uh, which was uh, reached by the two sides in early 1990s. Basically, uh, both sides agree that there's one China, right? But the uh, they leave the uh, uh, definition open. Uh, what what one China is that right? Is the PRC or could be the ROC in Taiwan, right? Uh, but at least the, both sides agree that there's only one China, right? <laughs> but now the ruling party in Taiwan, uh, the DPP, does not uh, uh, accept this uh, 1992 consensus. That's why a dialogue between the two sides uh, uh, has stopped. You know, since the current leader came to office in 2016. Uh, since we have a, a new leader from the same party that's going to uh, take office in May, so you can imagine next uh, four years, <laughs> there will be <laughs> uh, little dialogue, maybe even th no dialogue between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. And, uh, and of course, China is becoming more and more powerful, right? And Xi Jinping has this uh, uh, Chinese dream, right? And that Chinese dream includes unification with Taiwan, right? Uh, so China is not going to let Taiwan just go and become independent, uh, especially now when China is becoming more and more powerful, right? Uh, on the other hand, of course, the uh, United States uh, has a strong interest in, in Taiwan. The United States has this uh, domestic law called Taiwan Relations Act, which uh, uh, compels the United States to uh, help defend Taiwan, right? It's not a treaty, uh, by the way. It's, the United States is not obligated to actually send troops to defend Taiwan, right? But this law uh, obligates the United States to help Taiwan defend itself. So the United States is helping Taiwan uh, to defend itself by selling weapons to Taiwan, right? And actually now the United States is also sending military personnel uh, to uh, Taiwan to train Taiwanese forces. So you can see uh, the situation is getting uh, uh, more you know, tense, right? Even, even dangerous. Uh, uh, so China is not going to, uh, gave up its dream to unify with Taiwan, right? And the United States uh, found uh, uh, Taiwan is, is extremely valuable in the current US-China competition. So you see uh, the interests of these two major powers uh, really conflict with each other. So that's an, uh, really a right? uh, So that's another development. Uh, now let's turn to uh, Russia. <laughs> Russia is also a... a, a a major a third party, right, in the U.S.-China uh, competition, right? And, uh, of course, recently, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, was uh, re-elected for another uh, term of six years, right? <laughs> and uh, and Xi Jinping is serving his uh, uh, third term, right, of, of five years as the <laughs> president and party secretary. So, uh, really, no matter who wins the, uh, the U.S. election in, in November, I think uh, Putin and Xi probably will outlast whoever <laughs> will be the winner <laughs> in, in the November U.S. election, right? So uh, uh, this uh, may not be uh, 
uh, good news uh, for, for the United States, especially if Russia and China are working together, right? They may create uh, uh, challenges for the United States, right? Um, for example, actually recently, uh, Russia and China already are working uh, with each other, right? At the United Nations, right? I think uh, uh, in a, a, a recent vote about this uh, North Korea nuclear issue, right? There's a UN panel of experts who are responsible for uh, monitoring the uh, sanctions against uh, North Korea, right? This, this panel ha has to be renewed every year, basically. And it has been renewed every year in the past 15, 16 years, right? But this year, <laughs> Russia vetoed <laughs> the vote. Russia said this uh, whole sanction regime against North Korea is out of touch with reality. It's irrelevant now. So they voted against it. Uh, because the Russia has this veto power, then uh, uh, well, that uh, that the uh, UN panel uh, will expire actually by the end of uh, uh, April. Now, China did not uh, veto it. China abstained from it. <laughs> but but uh, in its explanation, China said, you know, we support Russia's position. So that's the uh, latest example of how Russia and China may work together <laughs> to create problems for the United States. Because the United States really want this panel to continue because we want to sanction North Korea, right? Well, that uh, UN panel uh, will not uh, uh, be renewed uh, uh, from from this year on. You know, so that's um, <laughs> really another another challenge, right? As we speak, actually, uh, Russia's uh, foreign minister Sergei Lavrov is visiting Beijing right now, actually, and I think uh, President Xi probably already met with him yesterday. Uh, just just it shows that uh, Russia and China are really very close to each other, right? Uh, by the way, when uh, uh, Jenny Yellen was in Beijing a couple couple of days ago. She did not have the opportunity to meet with <laughs> President Xi. <laughs> so apparently, President Xi uh, you know, treats <laughs> Russia more favorably than uh, 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 U.S. officials, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's something uh, we we need to uh, uh, work. Uh, next, uh, let's take a look at the South China Sea. <laughs> That's another area. Uh, you see some uh, uh, latest developments in the, in the region, right? Uh, I think we all know that the United States actually long-standing policy of the United States is that we don't take a position regarding the sovereignty <laughs> of those <laughs> islands and rocks over there, right? Uh, United States cares most about the peace and stability of the region, right? And the United States wants uh, the so-called uh, freedom of navigation in the region, right? Uh, because it's a major uh, 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 waterway for, for trade, right? Between Asia and uh, other parts of the world. So the major US interest is to maintain peace, stability, and freedom of navigation in the region, right? But more recently, of course, uh, you see a conflict uh, has erupted, uh, uh, not military conflict, but, but uh, this uh, uh, Coast Guard, right? Ships uh, from, from uh, China and the Philippines, right? Being a, a clashing with each other uh, uh, recently. Uh, what happened is that you know, uh, of course you you know that you know China has this expensive claim to the whole area of the South China Sea, right? These nine dash lines you know, basically covers <laughs> the whole region, right? Then of course other countries like the, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei also have their own claims, right? Uh, they cite uh, this uh, UN uh, uh, convention of uh, the law of the sea, right? And they claim this 200 uh, nautical miles of economic uh, exclusive zone, right? Uh, so, but, but China's claim is way more expensive, uh, reaching uh, almost to the, to, to, to the uh, uh, neighboring waters of those countries. Uh, so uh, in certain areas, uh, 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 the conflict has, be has become more uh, intense. For example, in a so-called uh, second uh, Thomas Shaw, right? <laughs> uh, I think in Chinese called Huang Huang Yan Dao, right? Huang Yan Jiao Dao, right? Anyway, uh, what happened is that in a, uh, it's a disputed uh, island between the Philippines and China, right? What happened is that in 1999, the Philippine the Philippine Navy intentionally uh, stranded an old World War II era warship in that area. They stranded over there, couldn't move, right? <laughs> uh, but according to the Chinese side, well, well, the two sides, of course, you know, engaged. In, in some bargaining, right? And they, they talked. Uh, according to the Chinese version, the Philippine side promised 
to remove that old worship. <laughs> uh, but more than 20 years have passed. Uh, they have not moved uh, uh, that uh, worship. Instead, uh, they have uh, they have some marines, you know, stationed in that area on that uh, uh, old uh, worship, and they they uh, frequently send resupply, you know, materials, not just the food and water for the marines over there, but apparently they are shifting, they are transporting some building materials into that area. So in the Chinese view, well, looks like you're not going to move that worship away, right? And, and instead, you're going to uh, consolidate that worship to make your presence uh, permanent over there. And of course, it's a disputed uh, area, and, 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 uh, and China will not uh, <laughs> accept it, right? Uh, now, now I, I said, you know, the United States has uh, no uh, particular position regarding the sovereignty of those islands. But the, since the Philippines uh, is an ally, uh, the United States has made it Clear that you know if a conflict breaks out over there, the United States will defend the Philippines. Uh, so that's essentially, <laughs> basically, the United States is taking a <laughs> stand here, right, in the dispute. Uh, 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 recently, for example, uh, Secretary of State uh, Blinken uh, visited uh, the Manila, right. He told the Philippine uh, government that our alliance is ironclad. And the United States will defend the Philippines if there is a conflict in the region. Uh, so you can tell you know, <laughs> the, uh, the the tensions in the South China Sea are also rising, right? Uh, and, and, uh, I don't think that issue will go away anytime soon, right? Yes. Um, a, a few other issues, but uh, yeah, I'm aware of the fact. Uh, maybe maybe uh, one more thing, one more uh, uh, latest development. How about the uh, trade and uh, High tech war <laughs> between the two sides, right? That's something that is you know happening uh, right now, right? Uh, I think it's in in the news every day, right? Basically, you know, high tech war, right? TikTok, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the 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 trade war was first launched by uh, uh, President Trump, right? Uh, but President Biden uh, basically continued uh, the war, and uh, uh, the the difference is that. The, President Trump basically went it alone, right? <laughs> he didn't work with allies and partners. Uh, President Biden uh, has taken a, a, a more sophisticated approach. He he works with uh, U.S. allies and partners uh, to form these uh, uh, small groups, security groups, right, to counter uh, China, right, uh, in, in, including uh, not just the security but also in high tech, right. That's why the United States has pressured its allies <laughs> to uh, uh, ban uh, high uh, high tech uh, exports to uh, to China, right? Uh, uh, countries like Japan, uh, uh, Poland, right? They, they, they have faced U.S. pressures to not to uh, export uh, ships uh, to China, right? Uh, very interestingly, uh, uh, Jenny Yellen just came back from China. You know what she did in China? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, yes, she uh, she liked the food <laughs> in, in China. You know, she had a good time over there. But I think one one of her main missions in China is to go there, basically, complain about the so called uh, China's industrial overcapacity. <laughs> what does that mean? Industrial overcapacity. Basically, China is producing too many electronic vehicles, too many uh, solar panels and and uh, lithium uh, lithium uh, uh, batteries. Uh, too, too, too many, and according to uh, the Biden officials, uh, this Chinese uh, uh, industrial overcapacity has created uh, problems for the U.S. economy. Even uh, has uh, dislocated uh, many American jobs. So uh, one of the missions uh, Yellen had when when she was in Beijing is to basically. Tell the Chinese, look, you know, that's a big problem. <laughs> you got to fix that problem. But the Chinese were confused. What are you talking about, right? <laughs> because we're going green, right? <laughs> we need to develop. We need to, you know, build all these uh, EVs, right? That's the trend, right? You cannot blame us you know, because we, we can produce more than you do. And our EVs are less expensive than yours. And, and what can we do about it, right? So, so that's kind of... A, from a Chinese uh, view, that's really <laughs> not logical and not reasonable, right? To ask China to cut its production of 
EVs, right? But but more than that, the Chinese officials said, well, you ask us to do this, okay, we may consider, but how about your sanctions against us, your high-tech bans against us, right? You're not lifting those sanctions, and now you're asking us to help you, right? Doesn't make sense. Anyway, so there are a lot of issues here. Uh, the Chinese uh, argument is that, you know, uh, we don't have, well, the U.S. argument is that we don't have a, a level playing field because Chinese government has invested a lot in those industries, uh, and that's not free a market. Uh, what the Chinese side says, well, well, that's exactly the problem. We don't have a free market because you you don't allow us to sell <laughs> all this stuff to to your market, right? Like a Huawei is banned, right? And you know TikTok is <laughs> in danger of being banned, right? Or kicked out of the U.S. market, right? What is that? The, free market thing right everything is about national security so the chinese complaint is that you know uh you are abusing this concept called a national security tiktok data will become a national security concern despite the fact that the tiktok ceo the guy from singapore right repeatedly said that we have nothing to do with china right that parent company yes that parent company is in beijing but tiktok is independent <laughs> we don't <laughs> we're not controlled by that company in Beijing, right? And you look at the management of TikTok. They're not, this is not a Chinese company, right? This is a multinational company. And the CEO is a Singaporean citizen, right? Uh, and I think they're, they're, they're going to, they're applying for US citizenship. They're going to become US citizens, you know, he and his family, right? So a lot of issues here. Uh, so the, the US complains about uh, overcapacity, you know, uh, uh, China invests too much in green <laughs> energy, right? Uh, China complains about uh, overuse or, or abuse of national security, <laughs> right? So you can tell uh, this is really a, a very complicated relationship with lots of cont contentious issues from, from, from Taiwan to uh, trade, right? From the South China Sea to uh, national security, a lot of issues. Uh, so that's why, you know, uh, my first point when I said, when, when, when uh, Trump and, uh, not Trump, when, when Biden and she was talking to each other over the phone, I, I said, that's great, right? I think that's great. That, that's important. Uh, because even if uh, they, they, they could not agree with each other, they still are talking to each other. Uh, you know, to, to quote uh, 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 this, uh, I think, I think uh, this British, uh, uh, former British uh, Prime Minister, right? Uh, Winston Churchill said, right? To, to jaw jaw is better than to war war, right? Yeah, I think they're, they're jaw jawing with each other. That's good, you know. Uh, so so I, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, uh, uh, despite the, the problems and uh, all the differences uh, between the two sides, if they stay engaged, if they keep talking to each other, I hope that uh, the real conflict uh, will be avoided, uh, even in dangerous places like Taiwan and South China Sea, right? Uh, if you keep the co communications channel open, you know, and uh, that the other side know your intention, right? And uh, uh, to avoid any misunderstanding, miscommunication, uh, I think uh, uh, probably it's okay. I mean, you cannot expect that two countries will become buddies. They're not. Good. They're going to be friends. No, no, no. They are strong competitors, right? They're going to compete, uh, compete very uh, uh, vehemently, right? Uh, but uh, uh, there's also hope that uh, they can manage this relationship. So that's the uh, context of, of uh, this relationship right now. I mean, so Larry said, you know, I should talk about the, some of the latest developments. And those are some, right? I can keep going, but I realized that we only have a couple of minutes left before we switch to the national program. Uh, so uh, as we plan, I think, you know, we're going to uh, watch the national program, right? Then after that, you know, uh, hopefully we have some time for, for discussion, right? I also want to hear from you guys, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, what you, What's your thought uh, about uh, this relationship, right? Uh, how can the two countries uh, uh, manage manage this difficult relationship to avoid conflict, right? Nobody wants war. Nobody wants conflict. Well, we want stability. Uh, we want prosperity. So that's why the two countries need to trade with each other. Uh, but those sanctions, the tariffs, you know, they don't help. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I think I will stop here, right? And. Uh, uh, how much time do we have? We have just a couple minutes left, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Very interesting to your Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so I'll tell you this uh, our here. It's a message.
Okay, so uh, just, uh, I'm just letting the Zoom audience know that there is a link uh, in which to watch yeah. the, uh, the the televised. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so I, I'm just going to uh, tell the Zoom people uh, the on the chat. Yeah. The Rock International Committee uh, website. I think it's, uh, it's live from their website. That's right. It's, it, 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 it's, it's from the website. Yeah. I don't know where to. Yeah, I think they're, I think they're coming. But uh, yeah, so there's the main projectors, unfortunately, not working very well. But we have to watch from the from the computer. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, no worries, no worries, no worries. Is not working, but over here you can see it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're waiting for them. yeah, we're waiting for them to start up, I guess. Maybe this can be this can be. Yeah, I mean, yesterday I, you know, I tried it at work, but, uh, you know, uh, I have no idea. Maybe you're watching from the computer. Yeah, from the computer, I think it's, but, uh, but at least we have the audio, so that's it. Yeah. I uh, well, it was supposed to start about now, right? And uh, a couple of minutes, it probably start in a couple of minutes, and then it's supposed to run until seven thirty, uh, and then uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's 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 at, it's at the uh in in initial committee. Uh, China. Yeah, it's ncuscr.org and then slash live stream.
I think they play it straight. Are you doing these features every year? Uh, on, uh, no, I don't want to say. Well, I have to set up because I'll to do it. Yeah, for some local things. Yeah, I see. So we'll see. I just say, but we have a few other China scholars as well. Uh, yeah, we have the Because I well, I went to Princeton, I went to Penn, so yeah. they had they had like big China centers. Yes, they yes. they were always inviting people like mm -hmm. you know five six fellow groups a year. So the problems with a large monitor. Oh, that's interesting. They're, they're real of China. They're they're a, they are maybe six or seven percent of Australia. That's yeah. that's very interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think they're, they're going to start it up soon, as soon as they get the speaker ready, right? Thank you again. Thank you again. Yeah, I mean, but uh, the, the man is unfortunately... <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's there's something that's going wrong with these projectors. So, uh, I mean, there's, yeah. but it's not like we have a giant audience where it's like uh, it will be very hard to crowd. <laughs> Yes. Oh, it's kind of bad. Yeah, 
I think the issue is that the speakers are ready for the question. Oh, okay. I, I, I mean, that, that would be my yeah, guess. Yeah, I mean, that's good. I mean, it was in the room because they, they said the time and it's seven in the ritual. Uh, and then they can't 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 then uh, yeah, I started last summer. Yeah, 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 yeah. I attended the first event in October, and then, and then Nicolina wrote to me because uh, yeah, 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 she had yeah, she had uh, had some other arrangements. So, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, last time we had a good attendance for those ones. Yeah. So yeah, specifically the the Chinese yeah. types. Okay. Uh, and uh, we have the but it's a but I was like, okay, you know, we have to provide it, so right. Okay. <laughs> I study mostly automation of work and future work. But, uh, we have to, we, we want to do a big project about interviewing uh, people from like agencies and uh, from industries regarding like uh, underrepresentation of minorities. Right. Uh, basically, you know, to try to increase uh, the diversity. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but uh, but but I read a lot about research in China. So my my family's from the East. Like a few generations back, they they are like yeah yeah they they are yeah. you know yeah. 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 So he, they went there. I was born in Austria. Yeah, so and then I was, they were doing Europe and then they went into the US. Uh, that's why right, yeah. And then, and then I, I probably have to go four generations to go to China, basically. Uh, I, I think they were still originally, some of them have, I think it was like the, the Republic days. Then, yeah, Republic days in the mainland. Right, right. Um, yeah, I think we have Yeah, so we are from. So, so southeast uh, from uh, we, we call it Moyan is like a town in the same main region. Uh, we, we speak uh, Hakka at home and then uh, and then I learned Mandarin at university. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's it, with, with some distance. I mean, it's not, yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's cultural affiliation. There's also this uh, a, a study. Um, I, I recently wrote a study about uh, comparing Hong Kong with Singapore, uh, global cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it basically, the basic argument is that the geopolitics uh, diminishes Hong Kong city. Because, because Singapore are mainly Jews, right? They, they're, they have U.S. military bases, but then they also have a lot of Chinese descent people that go to be invaded. Uh, but with Hong Kong, it's not because because the U.S. is going hard. Hong Kong's status as special city taken from other parts of China. I think you see from my as Lucy that city. I have checked that the destination is the city. 
So if you have like the Hong Kong passport, then it's treated as Chinese. Ah, maybe, yeah, maybe. Same. I don't even have to do Hong Kong passport. I was also interested in like the academic freedom aspect. So one of my colleagues went to put together a sociology program. They see that Chinese from Jiangsu province and he taught at the HKUSC, and now he's got a joint Brown University and I and then we had a phone call recently, and I was like, "What's going on?" And he said, "Well, it's about academic freedom." But because also like he's interested in like protest movements, he has like a big social media data set, and and it's like, well, you know. Yeah, they, they're not saying yet, like, you're not allowed to research this, but, but I, but maybe it's all of For a while, I mean, like, she was one of the most popular persons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and because, but, but she also, she was a labor song. She did the ethnographic work on Chinese labor. And she was kind of like, well, okay, you can't do that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, they, they, they probably just, they, 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 they can't get the smart results. Yeah. They, they can't they get the smart results. Like, you know, like, there is another thing that the same problem. We must be very good at the end of the day. So, yeah, <laughs> like it's really obvious. We may be able to get Clinton on yeah. the. Usually, it's the first so you can have it. That would be a pretty good comparison. So, usually, it's live, but it's like a Which last one with Burns? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'll, 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 I'll,
For more than 50 years, the National Committee on U.S. China Relations has been the leader in promoting mutual understanding between the United States and China, the most important relationship of the 21st century. The National Committee strengthens that relationship by helping people on both sides of the Pacific to understand one another better and to address issues of mutual concern through exchanges, dialogues, and other activities. These programs address key issues such as economic relations, rule of law, security, public health, and the environment, in the belief that constructive Sino-American relations benefit both countries as well as the global community. Good evening, I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And I'm pleased to welcome audiences from over 70 venues throughout the United States, Canada, and China to our 18th annual Chinatown Hall. Each year, we convene Chinatown Hall because we believe in the importance of educating the public about all that is happening in the U.S.-China relationship. This past year, in fact, exactly 12 months, has been pivotal, pivotal for bilateral ties, culminating in President Biden and President Xi meeting in San Francisco. Since then, we've seen progress on a number of issues, including bilateral communication and fentanyl control. And just last week, we saw Secretary Yellen travel to Beijing to meet with senior Chinese leaders. Yet deep differences still divide our two countries. Can the countries capitalize on this cooperative period or will we return to a period of tense ties? We're thrilled to have the Deputy Secretary of State, Dr. Kurt Campbell, with us here tonight to discuss the current state of US-China relations and answer your questions. Prior to assuming his current position, Deputy Secretary Campbell served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the National Security Council. During his distinguished career, he's also served in senior position at the State Department, Defense Department, Treasury, and NSC. Full disclosure, he served as a director of the National Committee from 2013 to 2020. And also full disclosure, I'm proud to call him a friend. To participate in the conversation tonight on Twitter, use the hashtag CTH20274. You can also scan the QR code on the bottom of your screen to take a poll and share your thoughts on US-China relations. Let me begin with a few of my own questions for Deputy Secretary Campbell. Kurt, welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. I was just noting this is your second appearance on Chinatown Hall, and it's only our 18th time. But tell me. Can I just say, please call me Kurt if you're close to me. Thank you. to call you Deputy Secretary. It's tough even for me, actually. <laughs> so, the, uh, tell us where we are in US China relations, where we've come from, and where we're going, and what happens uh, assuming President Biden is reelected. So let me, if I could, first of all, it's an honor to be with you, Steve, Steve, and I welcome everyone from many places around the United States who have an interest and are focused on where U.S.-China relations are going. And I, I welcome you all, and thanks for the opportunity. I want to say a word just quickly about Steve. If we are able to manage our way through a very challenging time, I acknowledge that, uh, and I live it. Um, it will largely be due to key people who are passionate and committed and determined to find common ground. I know of no person who has dedicated more of their life to finding a common ground than you, Stephen. We have not always agreed, but the truth is I've learned enormous amount from you, and I appreciate the opportunity to give and take. So look, I, I would say this. Um, I think when President Biden came into power, I think there was a sense that uh, China was testing us uh, and was proceeding under the belief that the United States was in some sort of hurdle to climb. 
and that they believe that they could um, press us in key ways, take advantage of certain opportunities in technology and security and the like. And I think what President Biden and his team has sought to do is put in place a consequential set of steps, first beginning with investment in the key areas of national strength, which increasingly, Steve, as you know, will be in technology. Issues like semiconductors, AI, quantum computing, synthetic biology, robotics, and recognizing that this is the high ground for um, national power and strategic competition. Secondly, working closely with allies and partners um, to build uh, a consensus around maintaining the global operating system, which we believe has been so beneficial, particularly the Indo-Pacific. If you look at the last 60 or 70 years, I would argue that they've been the best with respect to lifting people out of poverty, huge amount of innovation. And I think the U.S. commitment to peace and stability has been a large part of that. And then I think building on those foundational pieces has been a substantial bilateral commitment to finding common ground, but also being clear-headed about uh, engagement with China. And so what we've seen is a series of engagement, engagements, probably the most effective uh, as you uh, indicate, Steve, was in San Francisco, in which the two leaders underscored that, yes, there are elements of competition in our relationship. We want to keep those elements healthy. We want to keep that competition from veering into confrontation or conflict. We believe that the way to do that is to keep lines of communication open and the ability to be able to engage when there's misunderstandings or potentials for accidents, but then at the same time, find those areas where it will be essential to maintain communication and working together. I know, Steve, that you were in Beijing just the last couple of weeks with the most distinguished delegation of uh, business and financial leaders trying to figure out what's going on in China right now and what is the nature of our economic relationship, but we underscore fundamentally the need to work on existential questions like climate change. We think the people to people dimension, which has animated so much of our relationship in the hopes of people on both sides, seeking steps to increase trade, travel, those things are practical steps that we need to take. But at the same time, I know this is a long answer, we are having to deal with challenging issues like China's support for Russia and the Ukraine war. Obviously, we're trying to manage carefully and engage on issues where we have differences of view. And I think ultimately, the visit of Secretary Yellen and the call between President Biden and President Xi that preceded that, the upcoming visit of Secretary Blinken, these are all indications that both sides, I think for now, are determined to keep U.S. China relations on a steady, stable path. So has it been set for Secretary Blinken going? I think it probably has, but I don't think I'm supposed to announce it. But it's, <laughs> but it's, and I'm, I'm learning all these things now in this new role. But it, but it, it will be coming up soon. And and look, we think this will be a major visit. I think we want to display other elements of the relationship in terms of education, business, and we expect them to see the senior leaders as well. You mentioned my visit a couple of weeks ago and where we had the opportunity with some business leaders yes. to meet with President Xi. One of the issues he raised and one which I've actually raised is kind of the over-securitization of U.S.-China relations. You know, we've seen cranes, chips, EVs, batteries fall within now a definition of national security. What's going on there and what should we do? He's concerned that ultimately when you... Yeah, he, he implicitly recognized the Chinese do this too. Yeah. So can the two sides engage in a discussion of what is national security and a definition? Well, well, look, it's going to be important to have those discussions, Steve. I, I would simply say that, that the larger context here is important. Last year, there was an absolute banner year in trade. There's substantial investment flowing in both directions, lots of Chinese goods coming to the United States, lots of opportunities. Um, yes, we do hear from Chinese interlocutors occasionally about 
to your targeting our social media companies. I would just simply say that our social media companies are not allowed to right, engage in China. So there is an unequal playing field to begin with. And, and so look, I think what's important um, on our part is to explain literally what it means to have high walls or high fences and small yards and make sure that only the most careful things that, that require uh, scrutiny are um, observed with respect to potential um, uh, controls or uh, uh, areas that we would um, prevent certain kinds of engagement with China. And, and much of those uh, efforts tend to be in technology areas, AI chips and the like. And I think ultimately, our focus in technology are in uh, dual use capabilities that potentially can have security uses that are antithetical to our interests. And I think we've been clear about that with our Chinese interlocutors. I will also say that if you listen carefully what, what Secretary Yellen indicated on her recent trip is that we're also concerned by the potential of China seeking to use their overcapacity to flood American and other global markets. And she's more, I think, appropriately, and she has worked assiduously to build stronger ties between the United States and China. But she's warned her economic and treasury administrative and finance counterparts that if those steps are taken, we will not sit by idly. And what happened 10 years ago on steel with Chinese uh, products basically uh, squashing American uh, competition, we, we won't and cannot sit by idly to let that happen. And so I, I do think we've sought to explain clearly what our issues are. And I also believe that those conversations are helpful and they are ongoing, Steve. So this is not a dialogue of the deaf. It's the deaf. It is not a situation in which we're not interacting regularly. We are, and we are explaining clearly and unambiguously what our concerns are. Can we negotiate whitelists, things which are basically going to be telling businesses it's okay, it's okay, both in terms of goods and investment? So look, I, I, I think we've sought in private conversations with businesses um, to basically give indicators where there are uh, warning signals. And we've also indicated areas that we think are unexceptional more generally. I think today there's much greater clarity in the business community about what's acceptable and what is not. I, but I will also say, Steve, if I can, I think the limiting factor is not the US government response. I think you were there with the business community. The truth is there's some real challenges currently to operating in China. I know Chinese friends and interlocutors are trying to deal with that, but they have a long way to go. The business environment is not nearly as welcoming as it was 15 or 20 years ago. And, and, and I think being honest with Chinese interlocutors about that is important. It's, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, we'll listen to Chinese interlocutors and they'll say, look, we're opening up and we're following reform. But then if you really, chase that down and ask for specifics, um, they're not as close. Yeah, we, we certainly raise those issues with, yeah. with President Xi, the concern about the Chinese economy, concern about the investment environment that he responded you know, with. Uh, reform and opening has been the foundation for China's success and we'll, we'll go in that direction. We'll continue to go in that direction. Of course, the business community says, well, the proof is gonna be in the pudding. Yeah. We got it exactly what you're saying. We have to see how things are. Just, just on that, Steve, I will say this. Look, I, I don't envy the current generation of financial diplomats in China. The challenges are enormous, but they're also following the wake of literally the most effective global diplomats, financial engineers of modern times. Wang Qishan, Leo, uh, these people were incredibly effective at managing reopening to the West and trying to preserve certain advantages. I think some of the, the, the current team have a lot to prove and I think there's pressure on them to try to be able to take the necessary steps to deal with youth unemployment, 
property challenges, uh, issues about domestic demand, local confidence generally in among China's firms. These are all things that frankly are unrelated to the United States that China will have to deal with. We want to go to our first audience question, which is going to be from Isabel Mashlam at Northwestern University's Town Hall. Isabel, go ahead. Hi, I'm Isabel Mashlam. I'm a junior from Iowa City, Iowa, and I'm studying international studies and political science. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my question is, President Xi Jinping said to President Biden last week on their phone call that China is not trying to outcompete the United States. Do you believe this to be true? How would you describe the current U.S.-China relationship? Before you answer that question, thank you. It's a great question. The um, We're trying something new this year, which is we have, uh, we're polling our audience uh, on what they think uh, China is, you know, one word. And we have competitor, partner, frenemy, or enemy. And obviously, competitor looks like it's 57%, frenemy 30%, enemy only 6%, and partner 7%. So that's kind of obviously we we are this is a very unscientific sample, but but it's a sophisticated sample, and I appreciate the question very much. Thank you for that. Look, my sense is. Uh, that uh, China is a serious country. I think they seek advantage where they can find it. And yes, I think they are fierce, intense competitors, as is the United States. I think competition is what has driven the United States forward. It is what animates uh, China's purpose, both domestically and the global stage. And so I don't think we should in any way discourage fierce competition. I think the key is to make sure that that competition is fair, that it is transparent, and that it doesn't veer into conflict uh, or uh, instability. And I think that's our goal as we go forward. But I do believe that China is beating the whip without question. Yeah. Let's go to our, our next question uh, to Tulane University Town Hall. Uh, Gabriella. Hello, De Deputy Secretary Campbell. My name is Gabriela Preziosi, and I go to Tulane University. Um, thank you so much for having me. My question is, given the complexities of the United States-China relationship, what are the key areas you believe the United States can and should seek engagement with China, and how would you prioritize these areas? We also polled the audience, this coincidence, we also polled the audience on, on this. So let's see what the results of that were. In other words, where are the areas um, that the audience thought we could cooperate? And it looks like this is where. That's Trade and investment, uh, illicit drugs looks substantial there. I can't tell if that's, um, uh, looks like it's, uh, a nine or nine percent. Yeah. Hard to tell exactly. But people to people looks like it's yeah. four percent international conflict resolution, which I take it refers to the Middle East and Ukraine, 22 percent technology, 19 percent climate, 28 percent illicit drugs, 30 something percent, and trade investment, 27 percent. But where do you think we could cooperate? These are all this is a great list. This I just want to commend you on this this format, Steve. It's wonderful to link all these people together. And it's great to see students so uh, engaged. And I, I commend you on that, the important role of thinking about the world and asking these hard questions. Look, um, these are all critical issues at my core. I believe that the essential fundamental responsibility of the United States and China is to take climate uh, seriously as an existential issue. I really commend the work, the passionate work that Secretary Kerry as a climate envoy uh, undertook uh, uh, um, really uh, without uh, any pause and tremendous intensity over the course of the last three years. But I will also say, I, I think the United States has been ambitious in a number of areas. We're gonna, we're gonna need to see more from China. And I think given their slowdown, some of their um, more ambition, uh, ambitious climate goals have fallen by the wayside. I think we're in a situation now where climate's, climate, China's emissions are over 50% of global emissions. 
uh, in rising. Um, uh, they've made a big deal about not financing coal uh, plants externally, but have continued them domestically. Um, these are areas that we've got to be clear about. And I think, you know, we tend to just be grateful when Chinese interlocutors come to um, come to various international climate forums. We need to see more progress there. I think the United States has taken very challenging steps. Our issues are going to be followed through more than anything else. For China, it is to make the kind of commitments and follow through on them domestically more than anything else. I think uh, people to people uh, issues are important, educational opportunities. I do think there are areas where the United States and China can work together. When I was assistant secretary here in the past, we worked quietly on uh, issues that were uh, challenging on the Korean Peninsula with North Korea. We also worked smooth on Burma. I think there are areas where our interests uh, overlap and we can perhaps not necessarily cooperate, but align and make sure that we are in close uh, consultation and communication. Ultimately, what we have to be about is building habits of cooperation. And in truth, despite the remarkable um, engagement between our two sides, the, the sense of entanglement economically and commercially, we, we have not built the habits of necessary cooperation that will be essential if the US China relationship is to flourish in the future. How destructive is China's relationship with Russia in terms of building these habits of cooperation? So, this morning, as you know, I watch the Chinese news every morning. Yeah. And this morning, I awakened to uh, Xi Jinping sitting at the head of the table with Lavrov sitting on his left and Wang Yi sitting on his right on a, on a rectangular table. And so, or, you know, it was the celebration of the 75th anniversary yes. of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the Soviet Union and China. But it's pretty disruptive. Yeah. So look, guys, I will tell you that, you know, Steve has helped me and, and tutored me and lectured me. The one area that we disagreed at, at the outset, I'm going to say on air, that I think I was right about, was the relationship between uh, China, Russia, which I think is a great Well, you heard a little bit. I, I, I tell you what the other position we, is. We fought about it. But let, let me tell you what I think what we're facing, uh, uh, friends. Look, look um, we often hear from Chinese interlocutors like this is a red line, this is a core interest, and we have to trespass very carefully on areas that are so important to their sense of national identity and purpose. For the United States, the awakening globally, our most important mission historically has been the maintenance of peace and stability in Europe, right? And um, I will say, and Steve knows this, we warned our Chinese interlocutors in advance of the invasion. Yes. I'm not sure they completely believed us or thought that maybe it would be a smaller thing, not an all out move and push. I think the Chinese leadership were surprised at the enormity of the, of the initial actions and then were alarmed by uh, Putin being on the defensive, defensive almost um, immediately. From that stage early in the conflict, I think Chinese interlocutors have made the decision to provide the necessary wherewithal in terms of machine tools, uh, joint use capabilities, a whole variety of capacity, Steve, to basically allow Russia to retool. Now, I think initially that was a defensive ability. We did not want to see regime change. They didn't want to see Putin fall. Let's remember that the relationship that she has invested the most with globally is not a Western leader, but President Putin. They've met dozens of times, up to 50 times hundreds of hours. They endeavor to build a partnership that's largely based on agreement with the West and the United States. But we're in a different situation now. So Russia is almost completely retooled. And they now pose a significant threat um, going forward to Ukraine. Yeah.
fact that if this continues, it will have an impact on the China relationship. We will not sit by and say everything is fine. For instance, if Russia's offenses continue and they gain territory in Ukraine, that will alter the balance of power in Europe in ways that are, frankly, uh, unacceptable from our perspective. And we will see this not as a just a Russian unique set of activities, but a joint set of activities backed by the Chinese, but also that this is antithetical to our interests. And we've been clear and transparent with them about this. It's so interesting in the meeting with President Xi, he was talking about economic resilience of China. So he's been sending a message the economy, we are resilient. We're going to make our 5.2%. It's the new model. We're not, we can do 10, but that would be qualitatively not good growth. And then he said something, he says, we're resilient. Look at our history. Then he said in 1956, the Soviet Union withdrew its machinery from the northeastern China. And I kind of went, wow, he knows this history. Two years later, we did my that day of the nuclear weapon. And he's China did, but yeah. China showed its resilience. But that he used that as an example was kind of, to me, quite interesting. Well, um, Steve, I'm not sure you remember this, but we were talking after the Bali summit. And I mentioned to you that President Xi used that very same historical experience. And I think occasionally what he will say to Western interlocutors is that no matter what you do, you try to withhold capabilities, we're going to persevere and we'll overcome obstacles. Um, look, I don't think that relates directly with um, Ukraine. I, I would simply say that I do not believe what China is doing here is in the interests of Europe, the United States. But I will also say I don't believe that China fundamentally um, wants to see at this juncture the borders of Europe um, fundamentally rewritten through conflict. I don't think that is in their strategic interests. On something we, we disagreed about slightly, but then we came to agreement, which is official contact between between uh, U.S. government officials and Chinese government officials. How is it today, and how is your relationship in terms of communications with your counterpart? Look, Steve, at the time, one of the things that, that Steve uh, would, would, would ask me about, he said, look, you know, you've got to meet more, you've got to engage more the Chinese ambassador. I, I will tell you now, Tim, until I was meeting with him regularly, because really other meetings, he really wanted higher level engagement. This is our former ambassador, Chin Yang. And Steve was very good at trying to build those bridges. You know, at the time, I think Steve was the first to know that Qing Gong's, at that time, Qing Gong's potential trajectory would have made him one of the most powerful um, officials in the conduct of Chinese foreign ministry, basically of the last 30 or 40 years. He had that potential ahead of him. Now, we still don't really know exactly what happened. This is a topic that you cannot discuss with Chinese Americans. If you brought his name up, there would be an immediate silence and there would be no discussion of him. Um, but the, the truth is that um, Steve's encouragement to me and others who engage with them um, intensively was very helpful in terms of passing messages at points of tension in cross-strait relations. Um, we are uh, actively engaged with all our counterparts. I've had a recent call um, with the executive vice minister. We see the ambassador regularly. I, I think we are now back to a situation in which the lines of communication are almost fully open. What we're still seeking, Steve, is more engagement on the military and operational side. And I think the Chinese system is ready to take those steps and we're ready to you know, meet them halfway in, in uh, keeping those lines of communications open. Where it's in the afternoon, let's go to the University of Hawaii uh, to Brent White to ask his question. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Brent White, Chief Global Officer at the University of Hawaii at Manila. Um, my question is, is there any possibility that the level three travel advisory to China will be lifted or reduced in the near future? Is there a disincentive to resume student and scholarly exchanges, which both the United States and China have expressed a desire to increase? 
Well, uh, thank you, Brent, for the question and welcome and aloha to all of my friends out in Hawaii. I had a great, good uh, opportunity. I was on the board of the East West Center and I had a chance to work with your institution extensively. Thank you for the work that you were doing. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I would just simply say that this is certainly an issue under active consideration. And I accept your premise that these travel advisories have served as an inhibition to the kinds of rebuilding the kinds of people to people and other academic exchanges that we've seen in the past. So I, I, I would just simply say under active consideration. The um, another follow up question actually from uh, Pin Me from Watch Young American, Dennis Simon from ICAS, both ask, you know, presidency at the, at the dinner you were at talked about 50,000 American students over the next five years going to China. Uh, what's your view of that initiative? And is there a U.S. strategy? I mean, we think, I assume you think this is good to have Americans study in China and speak Chinese and kind of understand their culture better and come back and work at the State Department is a good thing. Steve, I would simply say I first met you when I, well, not my first, but my first really active engagement with you was part of an initiative that I did in the previous Obama administration called 100,000 Strong, right. in which I tried to take active steps, actually work to build a foundation that would actively promote American students studying in China. And we reached that goal of 100,000 over a couple of years, and we were proud of that. Now, a host of things have taken place, COVID, other uh, challenges and restrictions, some on our side, some on the Chinese side. Um, I do not believe the environment is as hospitable for education exchange as it was in the past. And I think both sides are going to need to take steps. It's not just the United States. But we're in a situation now today, Steve, where the number of Chinese students is on the upswing from China to the United States. And the number of American students studying in China has plummeted absolutely. And that's plummeted for a variety of reasons. And it's not only that Americans are looking at other places um, and some are choosing to stay home, but I think they do have some concerns about studying in China or in their concerns about academic freedom. I think it's it's really important is the department I know the department has an initiative to get more yeah, Chinese yeah. speakers in the lower levels of the as, as, is it succeeding I, look we're we're, we're I, I think the truth is, Steve, we're trying to build capacity across the department um, in capacities associated with the Indo-Pacific. At the core of that is an understanding both in language, history, culture of China. And I think those, uh, I think we're coming along, but Steve, these are not initiatives that can bear like, you know, full okay. fruit overnight. It takes a long time. Capacity building is one of the hardest things in the U.S. government. And so ask me in a few years. Yeah. The, uh, I can ask you something today, though, which is, and I'm always amazed, it's like fake news. If you live in China, can you get a security clearance to join the Department of State? If you've lived in China? Yes. A large number of the people that I work I with... Mean, it, have lived in China and have spent time in China. So, so the person. The answer is yes, of course. Yes, of course. I, people tell me, no, you can't. I go back to every that. single person, Steve, that you talk to in the White House and the State Department has lived in China, not just as diplomats, mm -hmm. but as students and uh, changing or traveling around. So, no, uh, that is the, not the case. What are our allies saying about our China policy? Are you getting support, dissent? I, I think we're in a better place now than we were a few months ago. I, I think there were, um, look, the uh, Asia's complicated. They have a little bit of the Goldilocks. You know, they don't like it when it's too hot, but they don't like it when U.S. China uh, are building what they view as a G2 over their heads. They want, they want um, uh, prudent, 
careful diplomacy. They want their interests uh, preserved and, and their uh, circumstances not dealt with above their heads. I think it would be fair to say that we are in close consultations with allies and partners about um, our relationship with China. I think, I think more than anything else, Steve, they appreciate we're talking to them more about U.S.-China relations. I think in the past, sometimes we did not share as much. We're much more open about what our goals are, what our objectives are. Um, I still think there are some countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, that worry that in a competitive world, they feel like they have to make choices and that they're somehow betwixt and between, and they don't, they don't seek that. They like the attention and the ability to leverage resources, but they don't want to be right. a pawn in a larger global um, competition. And we hear some of that more generally. I think there is general satisfaction about um, about the state of U.S.-China relations. I will say two different things, though. They are worried about the economic trajectory in China. They are not as optimistic about your growth um, uh, numbers as... as That's not my growth yeah, numbers. Or, or, it's or the, it's or the ones Chinese China. growth numbers. And, and they worry about the United States as well. And so it's not just that they worry about the state of the relationship, but they worry about the domestic trajectory of both of our countries. Mm -hmm. You've spent a lot of time with the Japanese prime minister this week, yes. who's now in D.C. Japan pretty much on the same page as we are? I think that's the case, yes. In fact, we've talked to the uh, our Chinese interlocutors about this relationship. China, uh, I think, has complex views, as you know, uh, Steve, of Japan. But the U.S.-Japan relationship is our most important foundational relationship in Asia. It is grown in importance. It's no longer regional. It's global. They, they're with us in Ukraine, in Haiti, supporting us in Gaza, uh, in the Pacific. I think Prime Minister Kashida is a rare leader. We've been able to um, really um, take the U.S.-Japan relationship to the next level. And it will be on full display over the course of this week. And we will also have a trilateral meeting later in this week between the United States, Japan, and the Philippines for the first time. And President Marcos will join us. Let's go to a question from University of California, San Diego. Uh, Gary Zhu. We're not hearing you. you have to try again, Gary. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gary, a PhD candidate in political science at UC San Diego. It was great honor to ask uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary Kurt Campbell, who is also a distinguished alumni of UCSD, a question. So my question is, how do you evaluate the possibility of a military conflict between the mainland China and Taiwan over the next decade? And given your evaluation, what do you think the United States will play a role in the future game? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I, I First of all, I want to acknowledge how important the question is, but I do want to just say a word or two. I am not a particularly distinguished graduate of UC San Diego, although I'm very <laughs> fond of my time there. I do want to say that the premier meeting and conference um, every year that is held to basically explore with the best experts in the world where China is going, where the U.S.-China relationship is going, is hosted by UCSD. I think I saw Lei and other friends at UCSD in the audience there, and I want to say hello to them, and we look forward to that meeting in August in La Jolla, following on the meeting that was held this uh, winter here in Washington, D.C., in which uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan gave a key speech about the current trajectory in U.S.-China relations. But what I was going to say is my first introduction to China was a class taught by Susan Shirk. I was a young student. She, she chastised me. I came to a class all wet. I had literally gotten off my surfboard. I brought it into class and my wetsuit was dripping wet. And she said, you know, you've got to get yourself in order. You can't, you can't be 
so disrespectful and you can't track sand and water into my classroom. I think from that point on, I became a little bit more serious of a student and so grateful to call her a lifelong colleague and friend. Look, the most important thing that we can do uh, is carefully uh, to signal responsibly our determination to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And that involves a variety of things, both communications, deployments, clear messaging. I would simply note one of the most important elements of the U.S. strategy in the recent period. In the past, it was often only the United States speaking alone about the absolute need to preserve peace and stability to sustain the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, a status quo that we think has served the interests of the peoples on both sides of the strait. Increasingly, larger numbers of international actors have spoken out as well uh, about uh, their desire to maintain peace and stability, to make sure lines of communication are open uh, and uh, to build a degree of trust and confidence. We do see actions on the part of the PRC that are concerning, increasing military activities, deployments that concern us. Um, but at the same time, we uh, uh, persevere in our determination to underscore our critical role uh, as uh, a key guarantor, as outlined in the 1979 uh, Taiwan Relations Act of that maintenance of peace and stability, which we think has been a tremendous uh, achievement that has propelled the region to greater heights. When we talk about um, uh the advances in technology, what TSMC has done is remarkable. We're grateful for the partnership that we have, an official partnership with Taiwan on so many different things. Uh, ultimately, it is our um, professed goal to do what's necessary to preserve that peace and stability that has been so critical to the progress we've seen to date. Let's talk a bit about kind of the ancillary effects. I'm a uh, tremendous effect, actually, of our China policy, especially, I would say, the last uh, administration, we've seen a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. So let, let our next question go to the New England Chinese American Alliance Town Hall, joining us from Newton City Hall in Massachusetts. Hua Wang, over to you. Hello, good evening. So this is Hua Wang, co-chair of New England Chinese American Alliance. So thank you for inviting us to participate in this important conversation. As a community organization, we're concerned about the increasing suspicion of the loyalty and integrity of Chinese Americans, such as the China Initiative. Such suspicions not only hurt the racial minority, we all know about the Japanese American internment, but also tear apart the fabric of American society, such as during the McCarthy era. So how to protect the equal rights of the Chinese Americans and avoid stereotyping Chinese culture and people while managing the complex U.S.-China relations. Thank you. Well, so look, um, I appreciate the question, and I believe that this is a very serious matter. I will simply say that President Biden, Steve, has spoken out on this. He has rejected uh, this kind of stereotyping. He has condemned uh, the attacks on uh, Asian Americans that affect not just Chinese Americans, but across a broad range of groups here in the United States. He's condemned that publicly, repeatedly, um, and in the company of prominent Asian Americans. He's um, appointed for the first time a wonderful person in his administration in the White House, Erica Martsugi, who represents um, uh, Asian and island communities in all things in the White House. She has been tireless in her commitment to ensuring that uh, we are taking every possible step to prevent this kind of blacklisting and, uh, you know, questions about the uh, patriotism of. Uh, honorable Americans. And so I think those are critical efforts underway, and we have to be able to distinguish between perhaps steps or activities, uh, 
third column things that China has done in the United States and also the activities of, you know, uh, of Americans. And I, I just think this is a hard issue. And I think over time um, we are, I think, hand handling this issue with greater um, care and understanding than, than perhaps um, it was done four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a large influx of Chinese migrants coming to the United States, kind of leaving China, going sometimes through the Mideast, coming to Mexico and entering. It, it's, Steve, it's, it, it has not gotten enough attention, but it is a remarkable thing. The number of Chinese economic migrants that have come to the United States uh, over the course of the last, you know, several months, a uh, number in the tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands. It is a remarkable thing. And I would just underscore that these are people, not the many of the people that are coming up the corridor in Latin America are absolutely impoverished with very little to uh, call their own. Many of the Chinese migrants that are coming have had to spend an enormous amount of money to get the airline tickets, to get down to join these groups that come up to the United States. So it is a it is a remarkable thing that we're seeing. It is a subject of some conversation. I think it's fair to say that the Chinese government is aware of it, probably a little concerned by it, um, uh, but I don't think they've taken uh, steps at this juncture to curtail it either. These migrants seem to blend into the Chinese community in the United States rather than being in the you know, taken care of by municipal or state governments. Is that kind of, is my impression correct? Steve, I, th I think that's anecdotal, but I think generally the case, yes. And, um, you know, but the, the truth is the, the numbers that we're seeing are large and, and uh, frankly, of, of, of gathering concern. I think if I don't end this, your staff is probably going to have me, have me lynched, but this has been just a tour de force this is no, a David, remarkable no it's, it's a, my pleasure steve you're the you're the host here it's been my honor and my pleasure i hope to do this again can i just say to the people that have listened i appreciate what you're doing i appreciate your interest and steve i we don't always agree but you are my friend and i appreciate the passion that you bring to this endeavor this complex endeavor of charting a course. For I, I value our friendship. And I think you're really one of America's great public service servants. It's really, it's remarkable. But let me just use 30 seconds to thank our speakers and partners across the United States and China for hosting this event. Uh, thanks to the Star Foundation for its continued generosity in funding China Town Hall. And finally, thank you to the National Committee staff for the hard work in coordinating this nationwide, I should say, this worldwide event. Thank you all. Can I also thank my team here at the State Department? We are in the State Department today. They they labored to put this together. I'm very grateful to our technical teams and all the people that have made this possible. Steve, thank you to you and your team. Be well, everyone. Kurt, thank you. Okay, so, um, so I think uh, we are going to call the session today, unless there are some yeah. questions that people want to ask. Uh, are there any online questions that uh, somebody wants to bring up to the speaker? Uh, Jin Chun?
If, if not, then I think we can uh, end the video recording or I don't know. Yeah, the okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, then uh, our uh, event uh, then uh, concludes. Um, so thank you all for uh, joining us here for the uh, China Town Hall. And uh, yeah. Thank you.